Hello friends and welcome to another Ask a Zach. I hope you are well today. Today we're going to talk about the Klon and the birth of Boutique. So while you're thinking about it, if you've been enjoying the show, go down in the corner and subscribe. And if you'd like to support the show, please go to askzach.com and you can go to the store there and you can pick up a t-shirt or a nice mug. Or also there's a tip jar information in the description. So I appreciate it. So thanks. So the Klon and uh, the birth of the boutique market. So just to kind of give you some context uh, before we, you know, go full-fledged, you know, full forward into the Klon, I think we need to understand that, uh, you know, what was going on in the world, uh, you know, of pedals and, and gear and such. You know, one, you had most players, you know, in around... In the early 90s, we're still using rack stuff. Uh, if you had uh, pedal boards, it was like the Boss BCB6 plastic board, or you had a piece of plywood, or maybe you had a couple pedals that you just threw down on the floor that you used batteries with. Uh, if you had anything nicer than that, you were you know doing major tours, and it was something built by Pete Cornish or something of that you know ilk. Uh, you know, during that time period, uh, there were starting to become a greater kind of realization that there were some really neat effects and amps and things that were starting to become collectible. There were starting to become a vintage pedal market because people were starting to realize that like the, the old TS-808, you know, that it sounded better than the, the later versions of the Tube Screamer. And there were other, you know, older pedals, like people were looking at old script logo Dynacomps and the Boss DM2 versus, you know, the DD3 or other, uh, you know, effects. And then there was just, and the, the vibrato pedal, all sorts of things that people were starting to realize were cool. And there were guys like Analog Man that were, uh, you know, that were getting into this used pedal market and this collectible, you know, pedal market was starting to, to rise up. And then, of course, you know, Analog Man got into making his own designs and, you know, and also modding pedals and, and such. But, uh, you know, and, and also, I think, in, in just in the world of music in general, you had, you know, hair bands kind of, you know, going away, grunge coming in. You had the death of Stevie Ray Vaughan. You had, uh, all of a sudden, Strats were cool. Ibanez reissues the Tube Screamer. Uh... Fender's making, you know, blackface twin reverbs and 410 basements and stuff again, which they weren't before that. And, uh, you know, every, everything was, was kind of changing and moving. And uh, Bill Finnegan, he, you know, he was a working guitar player. And he you know, wanted to get the sound of a cranked twin at lower volumes. And he tried out the Tube Screamers, and he thought the 808 sounded pretty good, but he wanted something better than that. So he got together with some MIT grads and started designing a brand new pedal, you know, from, from the ground up. So this is not anything that was based on other designs, although, you know, it probably has some relation to a Tube Screamer. It is certainly not a copy by any means. There are many, many differences. Uh... So, they came up with this pedal, and uh, here are some of the very unique things about it. One, you had a, a dual ganged pot. So this is kind of like a, a double pot that is mixing in clean signal, and uh, it's at its most noticeable under 12 o'clock. So when the gain is under 12, you hear the most you know, clean signal mixed in. As you get past that, it, it becomes negligible. And this is really, to me, in my opinion, this is where the magic area of the Klon is, is in this, you know, up till noon is where it, it really shines. On top of that, you had the fact that it doubled the voltage internally to uh, 18 volts. Uh, you had, uh, you know, this crazy housing. You had the size of it. You had the attention that was put you know, to the aesthetics of it. Uh, you had, you know, the, the horsey design, the big knobs, the big pots. You had the layout of the circuit, which was 
you know, interesting, you know, and, and I think, I don't know this is the case with Bill, but uh, through conversations with Dr. Z and others and, and talking, you know, with uh, Ken Fisher from Trainwreck before he passed away and others about, also R.G. Keene, uh, basically not just the components that you use, but where you put the components make a difference in the sound. And it's hard for me not to believe that those MIT grads knew that and they made a, a big housing in the position thing so that they could have the components that they wanted and they could geographically have them where they wanted them to produce the least amount of noise and, uh, and uh, produce the best sound. And maybe I'm, you know, inserting, you know, some of my own, you know, take there. You know, it could also be that they just thought a big pedal would be cool because from a marketing standpoint, you know, if someone takes a picture of a pedal board, well, you're not going to mistake this, you know, especially, you know, 94, or especially now, I guess, because of how expensive they are. So, also, uh, you know, it was a buffered pedal, which I guess that was kind of early, but true bypass was already becoming kind of a buzzword by 1994. You know, these were $225. And you have to remember that most overdrive pedals were more in the $100 range and or under. And uh, so this was a very expensive, uh, you know, overdrive pedal in 1994. You know, and you had some other, you know, kind of oddities, you know, about the, the process of getting one. So you had to send a, post, a postal money order, which, you know, you probably don't send many of those now, but... Uh, you know, it would be the equivalent of today of sending a PayPal friends and family to someone you don't know and you have no buyer protection. And so you would send this, you know, postal money order to Bill Finnegan and then he would ship the pedal to you and he was very particular about what kind of address it went to even. The reason I know that is because uh, my buddy Sean Tubbs ordered one in the mid 2000s and uh, it had to be delivered to the True Tone offices. He couldn't have it delivered to his house. So, uh, anyway, yeah, of course I checked it out with Sean's permission beforehand, but, uh, yeah. So then it, it became this whole other thing. And, uh, and I understand it, you know, because it was, uh, you know, it was very different than anything else in the market, you know, cause the other boutique guys, you know, were, they were modding pedals and they were doing these, you know, or variations of pedals and so this was a completely unique design. So it's cool. So I'm going to play a little bit. So this is a silver one. And then I'm going to show you this other one that I have. And this is a, a, a gold horsey. And uh, these are my friends. They're not my uh, clones. Uh, this one was actually uh, David Grissom's at one point. Not owned by him anymore. And... Uh, you know, it's been modded to take a boss type uh, power jack, but otherwise they're uh, they're both you know, original. So here I'm gonna play a little bit on my old Bill Crook Telly, and uh, just you know, I've uh, taken the uh, I had a set of Labrea pickups in there. Uh, I, I removed them and I put the original pickups back in. So this has a Florence TE60. And the adder neck pickup, those are back on there. Of course, I have my deluxe reverb with the vintage 30. This is the 67. And uh, yeah, this is it. Uh, there's no effects at all except for the reverb on the amp. And uh, here's the Klon bypassed. Here it is on. It's got a lot of uh, 
you know, it's got some mid-range to it. You know, different than a than a tube screamer, but it's got you know, it's got mid-range. It's got you know, it's just got that little bit of girth, and it really, you know, especially like this telly, it really kind of you know gets it more into a uh, you know a little more aggressive and a little bit more of a uh, you know, a, I guess for a lack of better terms, a little bit more of a rock instrument than you know maybe my normal clean sound, which would be more country R and B. <laughs> Again, that's the claw on. Spanky clean. It's just cool. Yeah. Now. I think the thing that that you know makes this you know interesting but also you know kind of more difficult is just how much these you know pedals cost now um you know because it's not like you can just go pick up a clon and the copies do sound you know very close there's you know of course there's the archer and the tumnus and other things and you know and they're good um but there is, you know, there is something about the originals and, you know, frankly, even the originals sound different partially because of, you know, component drift and such. And it's just like with the the two that I've, you know, got today, the uh, the silver one to me uh, sounds a little more open in the mids. And so, you know, and, and that's, you know, you can't really dial that out. It's like it just sounds a little more open. You know, the, uh, the, the gold one's a little fatter in the mid-range. And uh, they just kind of have, you know, their own, their own sound to them. So, anywho. So that's kind of, you know, my take on the claw. And, you know, I kind of only used one setting because it's like when you turn the gain up, it just doesn't sound as spectacular to me. It doesn't, it's not as useful. So... Uh, and I'm sure there's other claw videos where you can hear, you know, the, uh, the drive turned up more and such. So I hope you've enjoyed the episode today and I hope to see you next time. All right. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm.